Oh, we're going to go ahead and get started because Ms. Wyrick has to be Barry Godwin's office at 1 p.m. So we don't want to make it late for that meeting. First of all, on behalf of the AWA and the FDA, we want to thank everyone for coming out. We want to thank uh, District Attorney Wyrick for taking time to come speak to us. I want to apologize for the heat here, y'all. It's a little hot to go through the doors, so drink lots of water and hope you stay cool. Um, Amy Wyrick is sort of a homegrown hero around here. She graduated from Germantown High School, went to UT Martin, and is a graduate of the University of Memphis School of Law. She graduated in 1990, and when I found that out, I went and looked at the composite picture right outside of my office. She looked exactly the same. She was a composite picture from the picture. Uh, she was a 3L bar governor, which I was happy to see. But on top of that, she told me she did mock trial and moot court. She was associate chief justice for the moot court. She did mock trial with her now husband, who wasn't a resident at the time. So I guess it went well. <laughs> um, following law school, she immediately went into the Shelby County DA's office in 1991, and has been there over the past 20 years. She served in many leadership roles in the office, including chief prosecutor of the gang and narcotic prosecution unit, and the leader leader of the special prosecution unit of the criminal court. She received many, many honors for her skills in the courtroom, including the Board of Directors Trial Award for Outstanding Advocacy in Capital Cases from the Association of Government Attorneys in Capital Litigation, and she's been a frequent lecturer at many seminars for the Tennessee District Attorney General Conference and the National District Attorneys Association. General Rodgers is also a member of the Leo Beerman Senior American in a Court. On top of that, she's kind of achieved that optimum work-life balance that so many of us long for. She's been able to achieve great success and at the same time maintain a family, a husband, and uh, raise four kids. We can sit up here all day and sing her accolades, but we better hear from her uh, without further ado. Thank you, Laura. It's kind of ironic that the last thing I said was how I've been able to achieve the perfect work balance between my life at 201 Poplar and raising four children. I went to pick up my youngest child at school last night, and my days lately have been starting in the office about 7 o'clock, and I bust out of there at about quarter to 6 and pray that I make it to the preschool before they close down and charge me extra money. So the days have been a little crazy lately. And I walk into the school, and I'm out of breath, and I'm running, and I've got my wallet just in case I'm going to charge me, and this teacher meets me at the door. Which, having had children in preschool for 17 plus years, I know that's not a good thing. <laughs> And she proceeds to cross her arms and tell me that I'm not going to like the note that is in Peter Wyrick's file. Come to find out that Peter Wyrick, who is five, and two of his friends decided to moon the entire class. <laughs> <laughs> so, not being sure how to handle that, because as a mother of four and being 25 years old, never confronted that issue before. But hopefully we dealt with it adequately at home, including myself and my husband and even his big brother, who's a senior Christian brother.
go into public service or go into the private sector, you have to buy into it. That also helps, I think, achieve the balance that everyone, that we all strive for. And believe you me, I don't have any special formula. I wish I did. I wish I could look out over all of those young faces and say, this is what you need to do and this is what you don't need to do. Um, I can tell you that I try every day to find that balance. And some days are easier than others. Um, some days I don't do a very good job. I hope, however, 20 years from now, that my children are not on some therapist's couch griping about the years that they suffered because of the kind of and she worked really hard and stressed a lot, that they'll see the bigger picture. The bigger picture is we're making a difference. And the Sheriff's Department, the Public Defender's Office, the Public Defender's Office, so much has changed in Memphis, Shelby County, Tennessee, from 20 years ago. There are so many hardworking people that roll their sleeves up every day, whether they're in the mayor's office or sanitation department or public services that just want to make this community better. And whatever place at the table that I can have, my office <coughs> to accomplish that is really what it's all about. Um, my oldest child is a senior in high school. I also have an eighth grader, a third grader, and then <laughs> and my kids, the, um, the two oldest children were fortunate enough to be in our office in December when Governor Haslam came in and held a press conference announcing that they were going to give them the time to become commissioner of safety and that I was going to become the district attorney general. And my oldest senior Christian brothers came in the office. The governor's entourage had not arrived yet and we were kind of all pacing up and down. And my son said they took my Swiss Army knock down to security. How many of y'all have ever been in 201 Poplar? I know Juice has. Is that you know, Juice, same string fellow for those of y'all that don't know his gang name, it's Juice. So you know when you come in, there's a security guard there. Well, my son had gone up the guard and they took his Swiss Army knock. So my son was bemoaning this to me. Well, my 14 year old daughter looked at him and she said, Why didn't you pull the mom car? And I said, oh, no, no, no. Don't even start thinking that because of mom's new job responsibilities, you all are going to be able to tell officers to pull you over who your mom is and where she works. And to prove that point, I walked John Wyatt downstairs to the first level, and the security guard that's there every day when I come in and there every day when I leave. I said, you took my son's Swiss Army knife. Any chance he can get that back? And he looked in the lockbox, and I knew the answer to the question, but the point was to prove the point to my teenager. He said, oh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. It's hard. That's now the property of Homeland Security. And so, so that was a, a good teaching tool for him, I hope, that the mom card is going to get you nowhere. Um, I do know, however, that seeing children seeing their parents loving the work that they do and being proud of the work they do means a lot to a child. And so there are many days and many events that mom can't be there or my husband can't be there. He's also a practicing attorney. There are many events over the years, if we were to add them up, that we probably missed more than we've been able to attend. I don't know. But I hope, again, at the end of the day, when you add it all up, my children, and though they have missed some things, and maybe they're deprived of some things, and maybe, you know, mom's not there when they get home from school, they understand what mom's doing. And they understand how important it is, not only to my family, but to the entire community. To find that balance, again, you gotta love what you do. You gotta take care of yourself. I mean, I think that's just kind of one of those basic mom nagging things that it's very hard to do, I know, when y'all are in law school, you can do whatever you can, um, when you can, at odd hours, but you have to take care of yourself. Um, I tried, tried, it's been a little difficult lately to exercise every day. Um, and try to read something that's not law related every day, whether it's Gilbert or just something to take your mind off of everything that's on your plate that seems too much to you. Um, so if there's any little advice, so find, find whatever it is, find that peaceful corner in your house that you can just sit and listen. Listen to whoever your higher power is that talks to you. Make that time daily, hopefully, or weekly to have that opportunity to just sit and listen to your inner voice talking to you and making sure that you're on the right track that you're supposed to be on. Because what you
you'll find is, and I feel like I'm kind of going back and reliving my first days out of law school with my new career, my new responsibilities in the, in the office, you find yourself pulled in so many directions, <coughs> wanting to please so many people and accomplish so many things when you finally get sworn in and you start practicing as an attorney and you've had that wonderful ceremony. And it's, it's exhilarating, it's invigorating, it's energizing, and you want to conquer the world all at one time. But it's very important, yet difficult, to kind of step back and watch it all go by for a little bit and figure out where exactly it is you fit into that picture and how best you can contribute to wherever it is you find yourself. Um, I have tried, I don't know, over 100 jury trials. People always ask me, you know, which ones are you most proud of? Which ones are the, you know, is it this famous one or that famous one or this one where you're on the news and all that? And those are, of course, rewarding experiences, but I have found over the years that the trials and tribulations that mean the most to me as a prosecutor are those opportunities when I was able to give a voice to a citizen that nobody had ever stood up for before a young crack addict prostitute who somebody has taken advantage of and beaten repeatedly and left for dead and raped repeatedly. No one had ever counted her. No one had ever told her she mattered. No one had ever told her she was anything but a number in the city we call Memphis. And so to have that opportunity as a prosecutor to stand up for those <coughs> citizens are really the ones, the lessons, the experiences that stay with you a lot more than the trials that tend to get all of the glamour and the publicity and the glitz that go along with those. Um, the flip side of our job can also be the most frustrating, and that is, you know, our job is not just to go after the guilty, but to protect the innocent. Sometimes that means letting somebody out of custody, but you know Sam lived through this with us in the gang unit last summer when he worked down there, particularly in the gang unit, the difficulties that those cases present. You know that this guy is good for this murder and probably 14 others that have happened over the last 20 years that you've never been able to pin on, but you just don't have enough. But it's still your responsibility, it's your duty, it's your sworn oath, and the system would not work without it if you didn't stand up and say, Your Honor, on behalf of the state of Tennessee, we have to dismiss these charges. Those are difficult days in the office. But you have to, I think, comfort yourself and you know, get a little bit of sleep at night knowing that you took care of your responsibility, which is really what it's all about at the end of the day, is living up to your oath and your duty, whether you go into public service or not. Um, and I certainly don't want you to think I'm here. Although I do think it's the greatest job in the world being a prosecutor, I know that not all of you are going to find that to be your passion. Whatever it is, that whatever oath, the symbols of oath that you take, you have to be true to it every day, as, as difficult as that can be. Um, something else I found very early on when I got out of law school was the importance of not only being courteous to the judges, which of course, um, you have to, whether we respect, because wearing the robe, you got to respect the robe. But you've got to show respect to the courtroom personnel. I have seen so many young lawyers commit professional suicide their first day at 201 Poplar by storming in like they have got the answers to every question that we have been asking for the last 100 years, and they are here with their cape on to save the community 